So welcome everybody to the next panel. Uh, what are the challenges the Air Force will face in 2030 and beyond? So here we'll have uh, Dr. Heather Wilson, who is the 24th Secretary of the Air Force and is responsible for the affairs of the Department of the Air Force, including organizing, training, equipping, and providing for the welfare of 685,000 active duty guard, reserve, and civilian forces and their families. She oversees the Air Force's annual budget, which is over $138 billion, and directs strategy and policy development, risk management, weapons acquisition, technology investments, and human resources management across a global enterprise. She, before assuming this position, she was the president of the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology and Engineering and Science Research University. And from 1998 to 2009, she was a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, where she served on the House Armed Services Committee, the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, and the House Energy and Commerce Committee. She was in the third class of, of, of female graduates from the U.S. Air Force Academy, uh, was formerly a Rhodes Scholar. And uh, we also have President Michael Crow of Arizona State University. He's an educator, knowledge enterprise architect, science and technology policy scholar, and a leader. He became the 16th president of Arizona State University in July 2002, and has spearheaded ASU's rapid and groundbreaking transformative evolution into one of the world's best public metropolitan research universities. As a model New American University, ASU simultaneously demonstrates comprehensive excellence, inclusivity, representative of ethnic and socioeconomic diversity in the United States and consequential societal impact. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. So why don't we start with, you, your, your story is, um, has always been interesting to me since we first met uh, several years ago. Uh, and this notion of uh, coming from a family of uh, pilots and getting involved in aviation really early and then going to the Air Force Academy just as women were being yeah. first admitted and then somehow finding your way into uh, the Air Force and then, and then ultimately into um, you know, politics, member of Congress, uh, state politics in New Mexico, uh, running a company for a while, making things happen, and then you know, all the things that you've done, it's just, it's, so intriguing to me. So just start with a little bit about yourself. You know, uh, what has been this drive for you? And now you're taking this new job uh, in just a, a few months uh, at the University of Texas at El Paso as, as president there, which is a, really a frontline uh, institution in the United States of really significant importance. What, let's go all the way back to, you know, you, you first started to fly when? Oh, b b preschool. Preschool, right. Yeah. And my, then you got your pilot's license. Well, my my father, my grandfather would right. be a flyer, right. flyer, so. so Barnstormers, uh, your grandfather was a barnstormer. My barn, grandfather yeah. was a barnstormer and flew in the First World War and right. the Second World War, and uh, and uh, my father was also an aviator. And so, so I actually don't know how old I was when I first went flying with my dad, but I do know that the door was open on the Piper Cub <laughs> because we always flew with the door open, which I think of that now. I would never put my preschool children in a Piper Cub with the door open. <laughs> I, my mother was such a tolerant woman. Uh, so so the, the love of aviation, the love of flying, the love of all of that is from childhood forward. It is. It is. Yeah. But, but, so I, you know, I've lived a blessed life. My entire life has been a diversion from its planned course. Um, I, I, I uh, was a junior in high school when they opened the Air Force Academy mm -hmm. to women. Yeah. And while I was a good student in high school, that was not a door that was open. And it, I hadn't really, you know, I hadn't really thought of, you don't look at, I don't spend too much time looking at closed doors, but no. when that one opened, yeah. that was intriguing. And so uh, with my grandfather's blessing, I, uh, I applied to the Air Force Academy and was accepted, which was a life-changing yeah. life changing opportunity for me, because it was a full-ride scholarship as yeah. well, which you know, my family was not wealthy and, um, and nobody had ever gone to college before, so that was a big deal. Yeah, and so you're sitting over at the Air Force Academy, and you did very well. I mean, you became vice commander. You know, you did a lot of things while you're over there, and then something, another application comes along. You get to, you get to win a Rhodes Scholarship, and you don't just take the B fill or the M fill. You go for the D fill. Okay, that was, was all a mistake too. So, <laughs> so actually, I so I was taking this summer course in computer science because I had a really heavy fall course load. So I gave up my my vacation to take computer science in the summer at the academy. I had a great professor, really interesting, loved computer punch science. cards, punch cards, yes. you know the whole. I hated them all. I I actually loved computer <laughs> science, and and. Uh, 
This says something, I suppose. Yes, but, yeah. but I remember my professor that summer saying something to me. He said, uh, said you know, if you weren't bu so busy doing all this other stuff you're involved with, you could, be, you could apply for a Rhodes Scholarship. I had no idea what a Rhodes Scholarship was. I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know anybody who'd ever gone to graduate school. Why would you spend so much time in going to school, you know? Uh, but he said I couldn't do it, which made me at least curious about what he thought I couldn't do. <laughs> and, um, and then I ended up applying. And, and um, um, the neat thing about the Rhodes is there were 32 Americans each year who were in a Rhodes scholarship. We all met in New York to fly over to England together to go to Oxford University. The neat thing was that, that of the 32, 30 of us felt that we were the one mistake. And the other two were jerks. <laughs> so, so it's a, you know, it's something that is, it's, uh, it's not really something you earn. It's almost by the grace yeah. of a of others or a higher power. So you get over there, and, and then your interest was clearly, and then later your service in the Air Force yeah. as an officer was really about strategy and bigger and bigger complicated and relations things. between nations. Right. So just talk a little bit about that. You know, well, I served. Uh, I did um, international relations and international law, and then I served as a negotiator for the U.S. Air Force overseas, both in the U.K. and then at the U.S. Mission to NATO in Brussels, Belgium, and at the Arms Control Talks, uh, which was. Fascinating and great fun, and I got to do things as a captain that I that should not have been able to do. And and uh, and then uh, I left the service. I was going to go to law school, and I was narrowly saved from going to law school. So I married a lawyer. I, despite that, he's a nice guy. Yes. But I I never went to law school. Um, I ended up coming to the National Security Council staff for the first President Bush, um, at a time when when uh, we, of course we didn't know it at the time, but I was. I was working on NATO policy and, and conventional arms control in Europe at the time that the Berlin Wall fell and the Warsaw Pact collapsed. And so it was just a fascinating time. To so so your, your academic work, your, your staff, uh, staff work at NATO headquarters and among and between the allies and then later at the National Security Council, you know, where obviously we're working on relationships and, mm -hmm. and very complicated interplay between countries and so forth. And I'm going to build up to the, to the role of the Air Force you know, today. Yeah. Uh, what did you learn about, about um, uh, alliances mm. uh, and uh, how they work and how you build them? So you studied them, you worked at the mm -hmm. ground level making them happen, you, you managed them as a part of your role at the National Security Council. What is it about these alliances and then this notion that uh, uh, that's an important element of American strategic that, policy? That we are stronger together than any of us are alone, and that's true for a great power as well as uh, for any other nation in the world. There are some countries in the world, I was just last week on Friday, I, Thursday and Friday I was in Warsaw and with, with the Poles. And we, uh, you think about it, on the, on the first day we went into Afghanistan uh, after 9-11, it was the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, and Poland. Mm -hmm. uh, very close ally, but a small country in a very dangerous neighborhood of the mm -hmm. world. And so, so for the Poles, having allies is vital. For us, I think it's no less vital, even as, and it's actually a strategic advantage, because there are countries who want to be allied with the United States, because we stand not just for our power, but right. for their freedom. Right. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a strategic strength of the United States of America, and it has helped to keep the peace for over 70 years. So, so how does one, maintain an alliance you know how does one you know like 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 a long any long standing relationship has its ups and downs and its its moments and its arguments and its disagreements and so so what goes into maintaining an alliance taking the long view mm -hmm. for one and secondly it's often about the little things that nobody pays attention to on the front page of the paper just as an example um, common training uh, commonality or interoperability of equipment. Uh, you know, one of the fascinating things that I think is one of the strengths of the United States relationship with our emerging allies and partners started right after the collapse of the Warsaw Pact and the, and the fall of the Berlin Wall. We started something called the State Partnership Program. Probably nobody in this room has even heard of it before. You went, all right. I went to Poland. Okay. Uh, <laughs> then you know the Illinois yes. National Guard is partnered with the country of Poland. 
It's the great thing about the guard is that the guard is usually com more comparable in st size to some of the emerging nations, and there's longevity. If you're on the guard, you're there for 30 years. These relationships can be deep and long-lasting. The Illinois Guard has F-16s. So does the Polish Air Force. When, when we asked Poland to come with us to Iraq, they said, OK, we'll go, but we'll, we'll only go if the Illinois Guard goes with us. Because we know them. We know we them. work with them. They know us. They've helped us and to And there's no one of Polish descent in Chicago, so. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's the second largest Polish-speaking city exactly. in, in the world. So, so that depth of connection over entire careers is foundational. The head of the, uh, Pol you know, the head of the Polish Air Force has deployed with the United States forces in Iraq, in Afghanistan. Um, there are really deep connections. Uh, likewise, in Italy, where I was also last week, the Italian Air Force trains maybe 50 pilots a year. 40 of them go through pilot training in the United States. They start out being trained in the American system of, of uh, how to fly. Mm -hmm. So though you can't beat that over a 20 or 30 year period because it creates organic connections and like-mindedness uh, that, that uh, transcends the issue of a political moment. So speaking of politics, so you served in Congress representing uh, New Mexico and... Um, I was released for good behavior. Yes, uh, and so, uh, you know, Congress is an interesting thing, so it, it gets all this flack, and I, you know, here it is, it's the, it's the institution that we constructed to have our arguments without killing each other, and it's, it's worked very well. We have our arguments, and we make, we make progress. We've made a lot of progress, but what is it about Congress, what did you learn in Congress that uh, helped you to be a better Secretary of the Air Force? Hmm. I, I actually think it helped tremendously, and, and I think Dave Goldfein, our Chief of Staff, my kind of partner in this leading the Air Force, uh, would probably agree that understanding, one of the most important things that the Service Secretary does and the Pentagon does is secure the budget and work with the Congress on the annual authorization bills on fixing all kinds of things. The Air Force, my perception of the Air Force, and I think most people would agree with this, was the Air Force was responsive to the Congress, but not proactive. So, so you know, if you've got a question, we'll give you the answer. That's not particularly effective to accomplish what you, the, the, if you're to, to work effectively with the Congress, you need to teach and, uh, and engage proactively, because they have to be responsive to so many different things. And so we've tried to be much more proactive and engaged um, and uh, and uh, I, I think it's been effective. So, so I understand what it's like to be a member of the House, particularly, but a member of the Congress and the demands. Um, if you don't have attention deficit disorder when you are elected, you have to acquire it in order to survive. Mm -hmm. uh, so many issues, so right. many, yeah. Right. And so, so little. In that, I actually now teach a little course for our legislative liaisons on, on a day in the life of a member of Congress. So you can understand what their lives are like yeah. um, and why it is, uh, I can say this as a former member, so, so you know, I, I usually start out the class by saying, you know, give, give me some descriptors of members of Congress. And I said, unless you think that I'm sensitive about this, and I go up to the whiteboard and I write down, they're a bunch of idiots, right? And then, and then we do some exercises and things. If you have to be asked on one moment about pesticide regulation for the apple crop, and then about 8A housing vouchers, and then about whether we're going to open Yucca Mountain Waste Repository, and then the readiness of the United States Air Force, you're never going to be, you're always going to feel like right. an idiot. Right. And that's what their lives are like. So as the Air Force, we need to understand that and help them to understand what they need to know. Yeah, it never ceases to amaze me the lack of, of that understanding. You know, a, a, man, a committee of, of uh, like a board of directors of 535 people for a 325 million person society and a $20 trillion economy and all of the complexities that we have, it's just beyond belief that there's not more recognition of what we ask them to do. So, so you, you, you did a lot of things and then now you find yourself uh, as a wartime secretary of the Air Force, you know, where we've been in Com continuous combat for uh, 28 years. 28 years. Uh, the Air Force is, is delivering uh, lethal munitions almost every day somewhere mm -hmm. uh, against adversaries of uh, uh, various types and various configurations in various theaters uh, operating on a global basis uh, with uh, uh, unbelievable complexity. 
political complexity, social complexity, cultural complexity, uh, uh, this notion of, of how we do that and how we execute that against both symmetric and asymmetric opponents and you know, all these things going on at the same time. And uh, back at the ranch, so to speak, here in uh, Washington, you know, you're trying to oversee both the Air Force that's delivering this public policy outcome, which mm -hmm. is lethal engagement, uh, as well as attempting now to deal with all of the, of the challenges and the opportunities and the threats that lie ahead of us. And so, so before we talk about the details. Who would want that job? Yes. <laughs> People that fly in Piper Cubs at five, five years old with no door, not strapped in. <laughs> And so, and so, how do you approach it yeah. so that you feel confident that you are informed enough or able to be informed enough, mm -hmm. because you mostly make decisions, mm -hmm. uh, to make the best possible decision at that particular moment, realizing that you may have to modify that decision inch by inch by inch. As you, yeah. so, how, so how do you approach it? Well, I, I, and it's not unlike what you've had to do as a leader in higher education. The first role is to recognize your job as an executive leader is not to do all the work, but to find great people who can take chunks of this effort and move things forward. And the second is to set major strategic objectives, start out with a plan and engage other people in the accomplishment of that plan. I don't tend to be a micromanager, but I do try to look for alignment with people and have them develop for me how they're going to achieve certain objectives. And so, so we knew we needed to restore the readiness of the force to win any fight, any time, particularly in a shift to great power competition. And so we have been working on restoration of readiness. I didn't write that plan, but we got people engaged in pulled, pulled together 50 people from around the Air Force to really dig deep and figure out what we needed to do and then go forward and execute. And they owned the plan once they developed it. Um, the second is implementing acquisition reform. It, I, when I was a member of Congress, I talked a lot about acquisition reform. It's, it's, it's a heck of a lot easier to talk about than it is to do it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so we have been focused on buying things faster and smarter and taking these new authorities that have been given to us by the Congress mm -hmm. to strip time out of acquisition mm -hmm. uh, and to get capability to the warfighter faster. I think the, the Air Force, probably more than any other entity in the federal government, has been embracing this. Um, we're, we've now stripped in the last 10 months, we set ourselves a goal, take 100 years out of Air Force program plans. The neat thing to me is the number of small programs that are taking out 45 days. By speeding everything so, up, right? Speeding everything up, not taking out essential steps, but taking out unessential steps. Mm -hmm. The other is working with small business. Um, we did our first pitch day in New York. Small Business Innovative Research Grants, we have to spend 600, we, $660 SBIRs, million. that's the common acronym. Right. So. so $660 million a year that we spend with small business. Required. Program. Yeah. It's, in the, it's in the budget. Yeah. But we were taking 180 days to contract through that program. That's a, an eternity for a small business. We drove it down to 90 days, and then we said, OK, what can we do in a single day? Mm -hmm. And that just broke people's heads. Um, and they got the lawyers together. They came up with a one-page contract and the swipe of a government credit card to do a progress payment so that we could do not one-day contracts, but 15-minute contracts. Mm -hmm. We then did a pitch day, our first pitch day in New York. We came, we said, you know, broad announcement, some of our toughest problems. We didn't put it in the Federal Register. We put it on Google and LinkedIn and other places. Give us five pages and a pitch deck. We got over 400 submissions from small businesses, mm -hmm. universities, everyone. We chose about 60 to come to New York for a day for pitch day. 51 companies walked out with contracts in the first progress payment. Um, the average time to contract was 15 minutes. The fastest was three minutes is faster than you can buy a beer in a bar in the city of New York. Uh, and thank goodness for Bank of America, there's this guy named Scott at Bank of America who was on the phone with us all day because when you swipe a credit card for over $10,000, I mean, it raises all kinds they're, they're of They're all named Scott bags. at Bank of America. <laughs> $3.75 million of progress payments on a credit card that day. Um, we're going to do the next one in Los Angeles focused on some of our space problems. We had to change the way in which we do business 
in order to engage America's most innovative companies and people. And we are breaking the mold. And I, so buying things faster and smarter. Did I come up with all those plans? No. We found great people. We told them we'd give them top cover. We told them the first big mistake that we have, I'll buy the sheet cake as long as there's a lot of frosting. I don't like cake. I like frosting. So, <laughs> so we'll, we'll uh, and we enable great people to do good work. That's, and the top cover mattered a lot to them. So when something got screwed up, uh, they said, well, who's going to be accountable for that? And Will Roper and I looked at each other and said, are we OK taking responsibility for this? And we said, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, OK, well, then let's do it. Yeah. And uh, what are they going to, you know, it's like the both of us think, OK, so I didn't apply for this job anyway. Uh, I didn't anticipate coming back to federal service. We might as well do something while we're here. And so we are. So you're, you're the chief executive officer and the chief political officer in the sense of governing the, the Air Force from a political perspective. Uh, in, the, in the spirit of the American design, which is that civilians will always ultimately be the decision makers uh, yeah. for the military in terms of directing them and, and what they do. And that goes back to our, our fundamental design. And, and we're a long way from you know, the old uh, Gregory Peck 12 o'clock high uh, Army Air Corps uh, air wing. Uh, in a, Thank goodness. We got our independence. Yes. <laughs> emancipated yeah. in Yes, emancipated from the Army. Uh, but so now, so you're, so you, you now are, are managing, uh, you know, the, the, the strategic air command. You're managing this massive supply and logistics aspect of the air force. Uh, you're managing uh, cyber command, the emerging space command, and space force, and you know all these things that are going. So the assignment for the air force going forward is is in some ways almost beyond belief because because you, you, you're given this multi-dimensional space mm -hmm. uh, of basically limitless complexity. Mm. And so you, you, know, you, you have the, the possibility of uh, space warfare and mm. the maintenance of national security in uh, low Earth orbit. And then ultimately, low Earth orbit won't be enough. There'll be uh, mm -hmm. high Earth or, or even beyond that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, geosynchronous orbit or even uh, uh, other things that are uh, in, the, in the works and so forth. So, so as you think about now the Air Force and uh, all of its missions, and the complexity of managing it mm -hmm. uh, as an entity, while at the same time involved in these com these combat operations, all at the same time, how do you build organizational learning and mm -hmm. organizational resilience? Yeah. Those two things. Yeah. First, let me talk a little bit about the civil-military relationship. So, so because it's it's fascinating. I never worked in the Pentagon before this job. I, I avoided it. As a, I mean, actually, in the officer. building, right? Yeah. I, I, well, I visited you in your office a few months ago, and uh, a friend of mine and I were there, and we left the office, and we somehow ended up going out the wrong exit. Very bad idea. Four days later, <laughs> we found the guy that was supposed to give us a ride. <laughs> it was, it was yeah, it's pretty bad. So, so here's an interesting thing, and you mentioned about the structure yeah. of our government. The service secretary has, by law, pretty much all of the authority. The chief of staff has almost all of the influence. If you figure out how to work closely together. The four star. The four star, right. Dave Goldfein right. in my case. If you figure out how to work closely together to accomplish major things, you can get a heck of a lot done. If you are not aligned, almost nothing happens. So one of the real Perfect. blessings of this job has been Dave Goldfein, serving with Dave Goldfein as the chief of staff because he is an absolute A player. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we actually started the same day at the Air Force Academy. Oh, wow. So we were sworn in the same day at the Air Force Academy. And, um, and while we didn't know each other well at the Academy, um, there's a common, you know, I have tremendous respect for his expertise in leadership. Uh, and uh, one of the most important things for a civilian service secretary to do and say is, what do you think, Chief? Mm -hmm. It is to get the best, to solicit the best military advice. Because if you don't, the military will allow me to fail gracefully. Um, you know, that's, it's not really, that, but, but there is There often, goes another one of those secretaries of air. Exactly. You know, um, they, they told us what to do, and it's not going to work, but they right. didn't ask us. Right. So, uh, so 
asking for advice is one of the most important qualities of a successful service secretary. Mm -hmm. And this weekend, we were working two or three things over the weekend. Mm -hmm. In both cases, uh, he and I are both were aligned initially. We both said, you know, there's a couple of people we ought to talk to on this. Uh, we did. They changed our minds, mm -hmm. uh, and we adapted the decision as a result. In the end, we both started out together, we both changed our minds, and we both ended up together. Mm -hmm. But that takes a level of communication that's apparently unusual, uh, sadly. So that now it's shifting to big challenges, right. particularly in space, which you know, the America, America is the best in the world at space, mm -hmm. um, and our adversaries know it, mm -hmm. and they're seeking to develop the capability to deny us the use of space in crisis or in to war. To create a new point of vulnerability, yes. Exactly, and w because we're so good at it. What do we do in space? Well, we do missile warning, we do communications, we do what we call position, navigation, and timing. MTV. Which, which, all, which for all of you means the blue dot on your phone. Um, provided courtesy of about 40 airmen outside of Colorado Springs, Colorado. Um, average age 22, which should frighten everyone, uh, that they enable an $80 billion industry and provide GPS services to a billion people every day, all over the world. Um, so that's provided by the United States Air Force. So, so we do, we do, that's what the Air Force contributes right. through our space capabilities. Uh, n that was all developed at a time when no one could touch us in space. Um, and now we have to shift to the reality that space will be contested in any future fight. Uh, and that means understanding the threat, developing the strategies to meet that threat, and then the programs to support those strategies. So that, you know, all of us know that if, if warfare extends into space, everybody loses. Everybody loses. Uh, so we must develop. So the objective is to avoid that by making by certain that, that by and, deterrence, right? and develop the capabilities to deter uh, uh, in space in the same way we do in other domains, and thereby encourage an adversary to choose wisely and deal with our diplomats and not with our war fighters. That's the nature of deterrence. So when you think about, let's go back to you know. So the, there's obviously you know, unbelievably complicated. Uh, weapon systems, deterrent systems, information systems, satellite systems, and so. And you and I have talked a little bit about this in the past. You know, the notion of of what does the the airman or the officer or or uh, all of them together, as well as the uh, civilians, how how do you prepare your workforce for these complexities? I mean, so you you now are. Uh, cyber offense, mm -hmm. cyber defense, 25th Air Force in San Antonio, all of its reserve units all over the country. People don't even know very much about these things that are going on. You've got uh, all of your interfaces with the alphabet agencies and mm -hmm. you know, treaties and agreements and, and, and new weapon systems, F-35s coming online, which are unbelievably complicated in and of themselves. You know, you've, got, you've got this whole new strategy for uh, uh, renewal of our nuclear deterrence and how that's going to work and then working with all the brainiacs that are developing that and then this notion of of the missile systems and anti-satellite systems and all these other kinds of things and so in in, in 2025 or 2030 you know what do, what does a, a an airman first class need to be and what does a second lieutenant need to be yeah and it's not just that's airman first class and the second lieutenant it is what are the captain's major. So I'm starting any, with the newbies, the new More people. than any other yeah. institution in America, I think we have an obligation to show what continuous learning throughout a professional life looks like. And the services are, have always been focused on training and development of people. And the Air Force, more than the other services, is very technically oriented. Um, but, uh, uh, but this is going to happen in every profession throughout America. And, and you've faced it as a leader of American universities, the, the, the need for a continuous loop of learning for this generation is, is, is nations that do that will succeed. And nations and communities that don't are going to be left behind. So for our, for our generation, you know, we change jobs 10 times in a career. Our children are going to change professions two or three times in their lifetimes, which means we need education and training on demand as well as on command. Most people don't know this, but to be a senior enlisted person in the Air Force, 90% of senior enlisted in the Air Force have at least one college degree. 
Many of them have master's degree. That's for the enlisted force. You don't get promoted yeah, as People an have officer. no idea about this. I mean, yeah. So. You don't get promoted as an officer unless you get a master's degree beyond a certain point. But it's not just the structural kinds of degrees, and you and I have no. talked about this. It is the, con the, the attitude, developing the attitude of continuous learning um, that, that every organization is going to have to go through. The United States Air Force is going to have to do it as well. On cyber, we're trying to gauge American universities to look at how do we make available certificates and other kinds of things that are readily available to airmen and, and every small business in America to, uh, to be able for people to develop themselves in the area of cyber. Um, and, and we're trying to do it across the board so that an airman, it's as easy for an airman to do, choose to get, you know, develop their understanding of, of uh, Pashtun um, with an app on their phone, uh, and also to figure out and get the training they need in augmented reality or off their phone or wherever to fix the next generation engine, to figure out, okay, uh, and we've talked about augmented reality for yeah. our maintainers. Um, right. it's, it is rapidly changing, and we either embrace it or we're going to be left behind. So before we turn to questions, uh, I want to talk about this uh, discussion that's gone on the last couple of years about the expansion of the role of the Air Force in space. Mm. Uh, there was a lot of debate and discussion going on here, uh, both within the administration and within Congress on yeah. Space Command versus Space Force versus this versus that. I was kind of hopeful that they'd just say, we'll just call it all Starfleet and move on. And so, <laughs> but they didn't. And so, and so uh, where, where, is, uh, where is that ending up? Mm. Uh, what sort of phase are we at, sure. and uh, sure. uh, where, where, where do you think all that's going? First, we have reestablished, and, uh, and the, the commander is up for confirmation, Jay Raymond is up for confirmation to be the head of Space Command, so a warfighting command for space, which we had before 9-11 and has been reestablished. The Congress decided that last year it's moving forward and getting implemented and getting established. Um, second, the President has put forward a proposal to the Congress, which they are considering now to establish a separate space force under the Air Force. Um, and the, the argument is, first of all, I think we have to give the President credit for making space a kitchen table kind of discussion when it's a fairly small part of the military, but it is a key enabler for all kinds of things. And so elevating the understanding of space uh, and increasing the budgets for space over the last three years. So we've had double-digit percentage increases in the space budget in the Air Force over the last three years to get after this warfighting domain. Um, this, the organizational structure will be sorted out by Congress. They're, they've looked at the proposal from the administration. I think in May they're doing their markups to say, okay, what do they think of that, and then what do they, how do they want to move forward. So. A lot of that's happening in real time. So, so, and all of this will help then set up this deterrence environment for at least the near-Earth well, objects. The, the, uh, for us, it's it's uh, from low Earth orbit out to geospatial orbit. So, so you get to low Earth orbit in about three minutes with a surface to yeah. surface to orbit missile. Um, it takes maybe five hours to get out to geospatial. So, so that's a huge area. Mm -hmm. um, we. Uh, uh, we have to prevail in space and develop this deterrent capability no matter what the org chart is. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's the debate on the org chart of what will make us more lethal, lethal and more lasting over time. And that debate is playing out now. Okay. Well, I think we have a sense uh, of the Secretary and her assignment and, and at least a little bit of a glimpse of its complexity. Again, I mean, you're, you're not talking about three-dimensional complexity here. You're talking about multiple three-dimensional forms of complexity. So. Let's open it up for uh, questions from anybody, and if you could identify yourself. There's one in the back I see back there. Hi, I'm Jillian Rich with Investors Business Daily, and I had a budget-related question. said that the budget would include $135 billion across the joint team for penetration projects. Can you go a little bit about the capability and why that's important now with uh, great power competition? Sure. We think um, the way we try to think about this is two sets of problems, penetrating and standoff. And for us, penetrating would include things like the B-21 bomber, for example. So designed to no country, people think about air defense and things like, you know, putting a block of wood over some country to keep us out. Um, nobody can really do that. The best they can do is Swiss cheese. And our job is to find the holes and get in 
and go after targets uh, if we are assigned to do so. Um, and actually, it's not even Swiss cheese. It's more like fondue because the bubbles move. Mm -hmm. so, so, um, so penetrating is for us, it's things like the B21. I don't know what exactly in included in the number that you cite, but other things like hypersonic weapons research, which is one of the keys for us going forward. Speed uh, matters, and so, uh, particularly if you're trying to strike a moving target. You need to be able to launch and get there fast. So a small hypersonic weapon would be a penetrating weapon, as would some other um, non-manned stealthy platforms. We, we have one called the, the, uh, the um, uh, RQ-170. So those kind, of, those kind of things would be penetrating weapons for the Air Force. OK. Other questions? There's one over here. I'm John Herman. I'm a former Air Force guy myself. As you well know, there's long been a tension between training and education versus operations. And there was a certain stigma associated with being too academic, too ivory tower, and that being a negative for things like promotion potential or selection for certain things. As we move to a, a necessity of a growth education and training mindset, Mm -hmm. Shifting culture is harder than shifting technology. Mm -hmm. What steps is the Air Force taking to counter that culture and to beat down the idea of pursuing education or training is somehow against operations as opposed to supporting it? It's a great question. I, I did not set this up, but, but, uh, uh, but I, I, uh, I, love the, I love the softball over the plate here. The chief and I just uh, signed out several uh, pieces of guidance that we hope will help to change the culture over the time. One is that for instructor duty, uh, that will now be part of uh, the uh, consideration for promotion. So you will be boarded for instructor duty. Uh, very historically, and this gets back to not val valuing education, we also didn't value instructor duty. So if you taught at Lackland or at the Air Force Academy or at ROTC, um, or at any of our service schools for maintainers or anything else, that was kind of, oh, well, because you couldn't get another better position, and it's kind of a dead end. Um, there's those that teach, and then there's those that do. Right. So we have now flipped that, much like uh, joint service used to be required for, once, once that was required for promotion, and we made that clear, that it is a responsibility of every officer to make the unit better. And that means the unit as a whole, and that means developing the next generation of airmen. So we want our best role models and best people in those positions. That means all of you high need achievers are gonna have to serve in that way. The Marine Corps does this now. There's almost no officer, senior officer in the Marine Corps that hasn't done time in the recruiting service. It gives them a different perception of what developing the future force means. So we are now boarding and recommending people for instructor duty. And you're not gonna be able to get it unless you're the best of the best, and that will also be a consideration for promotion. That will help change things. The other thing is we've now set up a PhD management office um, so that if you have a PhD in the Air Force, your assignments will be managed like general officer assignments. So they will be basically hand done uh, so that we are managing and developing and stewarding that talent. Because too often in the service, if you come forward and say, you know, I'd really like to get my PhD in electrical engineering and cybersecurity, the, the answer is, well, you know, that'd be a dead end for your career. We can't be, uh, we can't do that. Um, and so we, we uh, have set up a PhD management office. The final thing that we'll be rolling out this month, we've been working on it for 18 months, is a change to the promotion categories. The Air Force, the Navy has much more stratification for surface fleet submarines and so forth. The Air Force has had, other than uh, lawyers and doctors, uh, pretty much everybody is line of the Air Force and they all compete against each other. Well, how we wanna develop you as an acquisition officer is probably different than how we wanna develop you as a maintenance officer. Uh, yet we throw you all into the same mix for promotion and then just hope that this big system results in enough talent being through, pulled through in different areas. We're finding ourselves to be very short on senior level expertise in space, in research and development, in logistics, because we're not promoting properly and developing people. 
we will be shifting to six subcategories. One will be for the future force, research, development, test, evaluation, acquisition. Uh, one will be for space. Uh, one will be for operations and special operations. And within those large categories, we will develop people for leadership along the way in their career, and you will promote and com compete against other people in your category so we can promote to need. Those things won't have an effect really this year. I mean, well, well, obviously they start this year. The real effect will be seen 10 years from now when we actually have more PhD scientists and engineers who are able to stay in for a long, meaningful career. Maybe one more question. There's one back here. Madame, Commander Armament de Longchamp, uh, French War College. Uh, at the end of last year, the president, uh, French President Macron announced his wish to have uh, an European forces. From your perspective, how do you consider this under US and NATO point of view? Thank the, you. Uh, the separate European force? Yeah. Joint. Joint. Joint, Euro joint European. Right. The, so, so this is the joint European force separate right. from NATO? Uh, yes. Um, merci beaucoup. Um, the, uh, um, uh, the United States, uh, so anything that Europe, Europe does to increase the percentage of its GDP that goes to defense is a good thing. The, the goal is 2% minimum. I think five NATO countries are on the track to, to meet that goal. So increasing the contribution to defense, uh, interoperability of those forces. But I think the most important thing for, the, for Europe to, to consider, and NATO has always thought this way, is that it is vital for the security of Europe to maintain the close connection with Canada and the United States. There's common values, and if a European force appears to be disconnected from the security responsibilities and the umbrella and the connection to Canada and the United States, that that will weaken us all. And so I think that is the only area of concern, is to make sure that, uh, that the NATO alliance stays strong. I would also say that, um, you know, and I remind some of our some, some of our American citizens about this, is that Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, which says an attack on one shall be considered to be an attack on us all. So it is the foundation of the NATO Mutual Security Guarantee. That article has only come into force one time, and that was when the United States was attacked on 9-11, and our allies came to our defense. No one ever expected that. It was always about the American security guarantee to Europe. But we should always remember as Americans that it is a mutual security pact, and the only one who has ever really benefited for it in active combat is the United States of America. And the, and the NATO allies responded and went into combat allies. immediately in Afghanistan. So. Our allies were there. Yes. Merci bien. Well, let's thank Secretary Wilson.